I have an amazing grandfather and I have an amazing father. And I have seen godly examples of my entire life of how fathers are to be. And I want to share with you on how we can learn from the Bible. And this message is more geared towards men. But how many know some women in here have to put on the role of father too? So we're going to look at some biblical examples of how, if you're a, a single mom, how you can operate under the anointing of God to be able to have a father figure in your child's life. Because father figures are important. I read this scientific survey that um, the, just the statistics of boys specifically without fathers is amazing how hard the devil is trying to take out the future men of this generation. And boys that do not have father figures in their life are several times more likely to live a self-destructive lifestyle and a lifestyle that is contrary to contributing to a society. That being said... Um, They've actually done a study of polymers. And what these polyers, polymers are, are your DNA strands. And the DNA strands, every so many years, your body um, replicates the cells, and that determines how long your life is going to be on the earth. And they've determined that single um, boys, specifically, without a father figure in their life, they're... I think 25% polymers are shorter than those that have father figures. So it's a scientific thing that it literally could increase your lifespan if you have a father figure. And let me tell you something, at Faith Family Church, you might not be a biological father, but there's a bunch of kids here you can be a father figure too. And there's a bunch of opportunity at Faith Family Church to do your part. Everybody doing their part causes growth. You might say, well, why would you say that? That's a terrible statistic. We should know the facts, and we should know that our God is greater than the facts. The facts were that the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, but God redeemed them out of Egypt. The facts are there are certain biological disadvantages to not having a father figure in your life, especially to young boys, but God, who is great in mercy, has brought a church here Faith Family Church, to have father figures, to have mother figures, to be here and give godly instruction for you to be the man and woman of God that you're to be in your, in your calling to God. Amen? So I'm going to pray and let's uh, jump right in. Father God, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. I thank you that we're able to hear your scripture. And Father, that your Holy Spirit does something with your scripture being spoken that people have ears to hear, they have hearts that receive your word, and Father, that they receive it with gladness, knowing that your word can change their life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to kind of jump right in. Men and women are completely equal in God's creation, but completely different. Jesus would have died for one woman just as fast as he would have died for one man. So I'm going to say it right now that men and women are created equal by God, but in their equality by God, there is key distinctions what a man is to do and what a woman is to do, specifically pertaining to a household. It is not saying that men are more righteous. It is not saying that men are smarter. It is not saying that men are to be dictators in their home. It is saying in Scripture, if we study Scripture, that there is distinctions that a man is supposed to fulfill one aspect and a woman is to fulfill another aspect, and them coming together have a godly family and a godly atmosphere and environment for their children to succeed. You guys ready for this? Um, men, their first thing or the priority that God has given to men is to cultivate. So what do people do that cultivate? They go and they work the field, they tend the field, and they um, fertilize the field. A lot of things with men in society, men have been the police. And the only thing that they're to do is to be police officers. And 
uh, it creates almost a certain expectation of fear that if mommy can't handle you, you wait till daddy gets home. And unfortunately, instead of men cultivating, fathers cultivating their home, they've just decided to be the police. Well, to cultivate the land, the land you cannot just do one aspect of cult- cultivating. You have to do several different things. You have to be there. So many fathers are not there. They're there, but they're not there. They're existing in the same home, but they're not actively doing their part in the home. And they're shoving all the responsibilities on their wives and on mothers. And we wonder why. How come it's so much harder than what I thought it would be? God knew that you needed two people on this team, a father and a mother, to raise a child. As much as I love my children... It is a team effort. It, there is a soft side of the mom. Moms are softer than dads. Dads could pack on some weight, but it still is not as soft as a mother's touch. I say this. There's a certain bond that a newborn has with a mom. That it takes about two years for the dad to get recognized to be at a comfortable place like the mom is. When every one of my children, they were great, they didn't cry that much, but there was a cultivating time where they had to realize when mommy's not here, daddy can hold you. And there was a time with all of my children that they went, no, you're not mommy. And it was a hard time. Every time. They could be totally fine, like open their eyes like, oh, you feel kind of different than mommy, but all right, mommy, what's going on? They open their eyes like, you are not mommy. It's like the scripture when the demon said, who are you? We know Jesus. We know this guy, Paul. But who are you? We know mommy, but who are you, daddy? And they cry, and they can scream, and then I cry, and then I scream, and then mommy has to come save the day. But unfortunately, fathers tend to, from that point on, all right, babe, you take care of the house. You do whatever you want. If the kid disobeys, I'll take care of that. And instead of being a cultivator in the home, the fathers become this, the fun guy. It's where he goes in the room. And I've actually seen videos where dads come in and the kid's scared. and He's like, listen, I'm going to raise my voice. You start crying. That way mommy gets off our backs. Now we laugh, but how often is that the case? Because a lot of times people say, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. And that shouldn't be the case in a godly marriage and a godly home. It should be a team effort to where the father actually, we're going to jump into Ephesians right here. You guys ready for this? And Before we jump in, before we start reading, I want to say something. The standard that God has put on men is almost impossible. And it is impossible outside of God's grace. Because God literally commands the husbands to love their wives unconditionally as Christ loves the church. I heard no amens, so I might have to say that again. (laughs) God has called men to love their wives unconditionally like Christ loves the church. Amen. amen. There we go. All right. I thought I'd get the women to say, amen, preacher, brother. I didn't get nothing. <laughs> like, did he just speak the same language? <laughs> and I tell you this, that men are to love their wives because Christ loves the church, not based on what the church did for him, but based on the love he has for the church. Can you imagine what marriages would look like if fathers and men would stand up and say, baby, I don't care that you made me wait outside 30 minutes while you were shopping. I'm going to share this for a second because it's Father's Day. Me and my wife went on a date yesterday. It was awesome. I love dating my wife. I said, we should date more. Everything's great. 
went to the movies, got out. I was like, we still got two hours. I'm like, great. She's like, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to go home and I want to jump in the sauna and then I want to jump in the pool. That's what I want to do. She's like, okay, that's great. You mind if I jump into this place right here that you have something set aside for me? It's waiting on me. I'm like, sure, no problem. I'm the man. This is good. It's good. It's all good, baby. It's all good. We're in Aspire too. <laughs> so I'm waiting. And I'm like, okay. Just have my, I didn't have my flashes on, but I'm waiting in front of the store over at Meisner. Cars are driving by. I'm like, it's okay. My wife will just be a second. Stop being mad. You know, like whatever. So all of a sudden, seconds turn to minutes. Minutes turn to tens of minutes. And she took the keys with her, and our car, if you don't have the keys and it's running, it will only stay running for 30 minutes. So then the car shut off. It's pouring down rain, so I can't open up the windows. I'm getting hot in the car, then it's fogging up. You know, <laughs> you know how fogged up windows look like in a car? I should have heard at least one or two amens. <laughs> okay. So I'm by myself, the car is fogged out, and I'm starting to get riled. It's hot. I can't put my windows down. If I open the windows, I'm going to get poured on. And then I'm looking for her. I'm like, and she ain't seeing me. It's like she's looking right at me, but through me. You want me to? Nah, I don't see you. (laughs) I had an opportunity to not love my wife like Christ loves the church. And I was a little upset. She came in, I'm like, girl, you said it was right there. She's like, well, something happened. I'm like, what? It was right there. And I got upset for a second. But then I realized, I'm like, you know what? Life's too short to be upset at this beautiful girl. And we ended up having fun after. You might say, why did you tell me that? Because God knows There's two imperfect people that are called to be together till death do them part. So God said, don't look at your wife outside of Christ, and I want you to look at Christ as the example. You know, immediately on my heart, because I'm working on this message, how many times have you done that to me, Chris? I'm like, stop, God, it's not about me right now. It's about my wife hurting my feelings. See, instantly when our spouses do something to us, when our kids do something to us, we're not to look at what they've done to us. We're immediately to look at what have I failed God in and he's restored me. That's how I can quickly restore and trust me, old Chris, baby Chris, a child who was married, that was me, I would have pouted for like a few days. I was a horrible life partner in the beginning because I actually thought I was pretty much perfect. (laughs) Oh, so stupid. (laughs) So delusional. I feel bad for my wife. (laughs) I really thought I was God's gift, you know? (laughs) Wake up. (laughs) And when I woke up, I realized it was a bad dream I had (laughs) for my wife. Are you guys seeing what I'm saying? When we look at relationships with one another, instead of looking at what they've done to us, why don't we look at what we've done to God? Because the sin against God's way greater than a sin your friend committed against you. The sin against God is deserving of death, hell, eternal damnation. But God, who loved us so much in Christ Jesus, forgave us. Ought we not to forgive others? To show the world that we love God like we say we love God? You guys ready? (laughs) All that just to read one scripture? Wait for the next one. What does it say right here in Ephesians 6? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Let me stop right there. The first thing that we need to have from our children is obedience. 
God does not say that honor your father and mother, then obedience will come. Because let me tell you something. Those kids come out of that womb, they do not honor you. And they don't want to obey you. I think kids' first words usually are no. My kids' first words were no. I don't know how that happened. No one's looking at me shocked. You're practically perfect, I know. <laughs> Wake up, son. Wake up from the dream. No, I'm just kidding. You're just like your father. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let me say this. You are amazing. You are amazing. It says in the beginning of this passage, parents are equal. It's addressing parents. One unit. Parents. Children, obey your parents. That does not say that you obey your dad and have fun with your mom and your mom's your friend. It says children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. After you get the obedience part, after I got it, when you're an adult, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. Uh, obey your parents, then comes the honor. You will never have the honor if you don't first get the obedience. I am not looking for my children to honor me. I am looking for them to obey me. When they do not obey me, then I will cultivate obedience. I will do my part. Let's keep going. Next one. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And then it stops. Then it stops saying parents. Stop saying Chris and Nicole. Then it could say, Chris, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You don't know my kids. That's what some of you might say. I'm not saying that about you. <laughs> He's getting beat up today. I'm sorry. <laughs> it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. If Jesus was coming over, he'd knock on the door. You know what he'd say? Hey, Nicole, where's Chris? This is something that the father's supposed to do. What does it say? The fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. The first thing he says is not how to bring them up, the first thing he says is what not to do. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction in the Lord. You know what that means? God knows that there's two imperfect people. There's an imperfect person that has authority, that's the father, and then there's this insubordinate child who's also imperfect. And God knows that when you have imperfection with man, our big thing as men is you better respect us. You could wreck our car. You could break something super valuable. But let me tell you something. You disrespect us, whew, it's on. Right? I heard no amens from men. I know y'all are not being honest in church on Father's Day. I should have had a bunch of amens, but whatever. I'm going to love you like Christ loves the church here. The biggest thing for men is respect. And if we feel disrespected by our spouse, if we feel disrespected by our job, you can take the most loyal person and they will change because you don't respect them. But when we don't get respected, the, the father of wanting respect and the child of not respecting, both imperfect, both produce what? Anger. I don't know about you, but I've said some of the meanest things I've ever said to anybody when I was angry. And I don't know about you, but some of the meanest things that somebody has said to me when they were angry, they still sting. So God's saying, before you discipline, before you bring them up, know this, don't provoke them to anger. Because let me tell you something, you're training your children to stay children forever if you provoke them to anger. You're training them to be controlled by their feelings and their emotions. You're train, you are training them to literally be servant to their feelings. And it's super dangerous. And then you're saying, listen, we've done our job. We've trained you to be slave to your feelings. Here, go marry, have kids. You train your kids. That's why some men and women grow up and they're quick to be angry. They're quick to be upset. 
And they don't know how to control their anger because they've been provoked to anger. And the training they received was when somebody's mad, say whatever you feel like saying. Then they go through life not knowing how to communicate, not knowing how to have good relationships with their friends and their families and their peers because they've been trained to be controlled by anger. What does the Bible say? Be slow to wrath. And sadly, sometimes it's our first play that we go to as parents. You disrespect me? All right. And we say things that we could have never imagined when our children were in their mother's womb that we would say to our kids because we were so quick. We were trained that way. Fathers are to take a leading role in the home. When the authority is broken because of our human nature, We have insecurities and shortcomings. Your kids might say something that your parents or some kids said to you when you were a kid, and it's as if they brought you back in time and you were right there, and your kid said that, and whoo, be careful now. Why? Because you haven't dealt with your insecurities. You guys understand this? insecurity shortcoming disrespect the man i got this on here you put that up plus insubordinate child equals anger and wrath if you want your kids to honor you do not provoke them to wrath what i try to do and i've not done a hundred percent but i have a true heart to do I have never spanked my kids upset. Actually, I've never spanked them upset, but I've tried to stay cool. I've tried to always stay cool, not go down to their level. Think about it. You're correcting your kid for being a child, and then we go right down to their level, and like, come on, let's do it. How can we produce the righteousness of God if we're trying to grow people up and we don't stay on the standard we're trying to grow them up to? You know what we've trained them? Stay kids the rest of your life. Then we have kids that have kids, disrespect, insubordinate, anger, and wrath. And you have a home that you can walk into and you can feel the wrath of man. You guys ever experienced that before? Psalm 78 says this, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and his wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. The other thing that kids are born with, they're not born with manuals, but they are born with little meters called hypocrisy meters. And you guys who are young might notice this about your parents. Your parents have ever said this, do as I say, not as I do. You tell your kids, it's your bedtime. Why do I have to go to bed? Because you need your sleep. What time are you going to bed? It's not about me right now about you. You know what the hypocrisy meter's doing? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Tell your kids, eat healthy. Stay strong. Work out. How come you get to eat a cheeseburger, Dad? How, how come you want me to run outside, but you're not running outside? Ding, 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 ding. You guys getting this? The responsibility of a father is to cultivate the home. 
the responsibility of a father is to have a re- loving relationship with his kid, but also discipline his kids. The Bible is very clear that discipline should not really, I mean, mothers have authority in the home, but the main disciplinary person in the house should be the father. But so many fathers said, like, I'll just go talk to your mother. So then this woman has her children plus a big child. And then she's raising a home and trying to grow up her man at the same time. Father's Day message. Yay. (laughs) Your kids can see your hypocrisy. So train them in the way they should go. Don't be a hypocrite. I say, you don't understand. And this is what I felt. I was bought this hook, line, and sinker. Babe, I am so tired. I work all day. I've said this to my wife, so I'm telling myself here. Babe, I've worked all day. I've had a terrible day, and I'm exhausted. I just need to go in my room just for like an hour, and it always turns into two hours. Can you just handle the kids a little bit longer? What are we saying when we say that? We're literally devaluing our wife and we're devaluing our children. When I drive home now, you know what I do? I have to psych myself out. I know my peak performance around 3 o'clock. After 3 o'clock, I start getting tired. My kids start peaking at like 530 So when I'm driving home, I'm like, in the name of Jesus, I got this. I'm a fun dad. I'm a cool dad. When I get home, I need to find where my wife has been hidden and locked away by the children. I just set it up. All right. Jack is probably going to be swinging off the chandeliers. I got to find Nicole. She's probably tied up somewhere. And then they open the door. Ah! What's going on? We don't know. It's craziness. So if I think I'm going into that situation, and I get home, and Jack's not swinging on the chandelier. Nicole's still tied up, but I can untie her easily. I'm just kidding. She's not. But I come in realizing that I only get about two hours a day with my kids. I only get about two hours a day. And when I realize that, I psych myself out, I get myself ready to be a father. My son Jack, I'll tell you the differences with my children. My son Jack comes up to me, play me, play me, play me now. Play me. Doesn't care that I've had a long day, and he shouldn't have to care. Because you know what? He didn't choose to be brought into this world. I and his mother chose to bring him into the world. And if we chose them to do that, guess what? When you're single, guys, I'm telling you right now, you're on the front burner. Life is good. You get a girl. You get married. This is for the younger generation. You get on the back burner. When you have kids, you are in the fridge. <laughs> That's just the way it is. You ain't even on the stove no more. You don't know what warmth feels like. You're just in the fridge. And it's what you signed up for. And let me tell you something. At first, when you look at it wrong, like, oh, kids get all the attention, then mommy gets all the attention. When you're really comparing that, all you're saying is that I'm still a child. But when you realize that our purpose is to actually get off the burner and put other people on the burner, we had a good, we had a good run. <laughs> you know? We had a good run. We were there for 18, 20 Some of us get mid-20s, we're there on the burner. Great for you guys. But there's a point in time where you got to get off the burner. That you've been filled, you're heated up, you're ready to tackle life. You're ready to cultivate, you're ready to contribute to society. You're ready to love a woman unconditionally like Christ loves the church. You're ready to train your kids, be there for your kids. Not just be the fun guys. And I've been guilty of that. I've been getting like, hey, we're just going to do something fun. So my wife's sitting there dealing with the, the raising them, training them, correcting them, and then I'll come in like, oh, it's okay, babe. Mommy didn't mean that. You're not really grounded. But what do we do? 
We show the children who are born with hypocrisy meters, hey, daddy devalues mommy. Guess what I get to do? I get to devalue mommy. But when daddy comes into the home and he cultivates and raises the standard and the mommy and daddy are on the same page and the kids realize, whoa, daddy's not only on the same page as mommy, but daddy's the enforcer. See, here's the thing, guys. Dads, we could be superheroes. We have an amazing gift that God gives us and he puts something in our kids to our kids think that we are the strongest beings in the world. My son, Noah, he comes up to me, he's like, nobody's as strong as you. And I'm like, I know. (laughs) Don't you forget it, Noah. Thank you, Lord. We get to be heroes. We get to cultivate somebody's perspective in life. We get to train them up to be a partaker and a contributor to society. We get to hopefully create an atmosphere in our homes to where when their kid, listen, I hope and pray that my children love God as much or more than me and my wife do. But the only way I can do that is not supplementing church beliefs, but living out church beliefs. I talked to somebody recently, and I'm going to close with this. I hope, I hope you've been blessed by this. I talked to somebody recently that does not go to church at all, has not been to church in years. Well, they usually come once in a while. And they said, we're going to start coming to church. We're going to start coming to church because the morals of the church are really good. And I want them to have morals, Christian morals. You know what I told them? It's very dangerous. You can't put the weight of your morals and beliefs on other people. You're a father, you do it. Church is here to supplement what you're doing. We're an extension of what hopefully you're doing in the home. You might say, I'm new to this. If you're new to it, we're going to give you the tools and the resources on how to cultivate a godly lifestyle in your home. But don't put that on us. We can't do your push-ups. You're going to come here once a week maybe a couple times a week, and you're going to expect us to put morals in your kids when you're not even living those morals? What do we say? Do as I say, not as I do. And then what do the kids say? Forget you. I'm going to do what you do and forget what you say. Is it true? And then we have the nerve. God, I brought him to church every Sunday. God's saying, did you go to church? We can't do your push-ups. What we can do is team up together. You do your part. We'll supplement. (laughs) I loved, loved, past tense, working out. Loved. We had a great affair, me and working out. (laughs) I saw great results. I worked out for years. I didn't see near the results that I saw four or five years ago. I was in the best shape of my life. The only difference, it's not that I didn't work out any less. I actually probably did work out less. But I changed my diet. I changed my daily decisions. And the weight fell off. I lost 44 pounds in four months and four days not changing anything other than my diet. You might say, why are you saying that? Because the daily decisions that I was making before, even though I was putting the work in, I never got the results I wanted to see. But when I started making the right choices daily, plus the exercise, the weight fell off. Who knew when you eat less and work out, you lose weight? Thought it was a mystery. (laughs) That's not true. It is true. Who knows, if you daily put God first, fathers, put God first. Let your, chi- your children see what's your priority anyway. They're watching you. Show them that God is your first priority. I want my kids to know that God was here. How do I do that? I cultivate them. 
We're driving. What do I say now? Isn't it cool that God did this for us? Isn't it cool that God did this for us? I'm constantly bringing a conversation because I'm the cultivator in the home. I'm the one that gets the, the conversation started. What are you learning about in church? What are you guys learning about in school? I'm asking questions. The other thing me and my son did, I don't like Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of faces now. That's how Noah's face was. But you know what me and my son did last Saturday? We went Pokemon hunting for like two and a half hours, three hours. You know how much fun I had? This much. So much fun. You know why? Because I was hanging out with my son. I was cultivating a relationship. Something that I don't value. I don't value Pokemon like my son. But let me tell you something now. I'm learning. You know why? Because he's worth it to me. Minecraft. Those are not my video games. I don't like those, vi those games. I love hanging out with my son. So me and my son, we play Minecraft. We played for hours. And he's like, Dad, we need to do this potion, this potion, this potion. I'm like, listen, dude, I don't want to do that. Just give me a shovel or a stick, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mine. That's all I want to do. And then I call him like, Noah, my, my thing broke. I need you. So he'd have to do this warp thing, and he'd come to me. He's like, all right, Dad. And I'm like, let's make something grand. And we'd make a house. And I thought it was awesome. Come in, we save it, and you guys are like, what are you talking about? This is exactly how I was when I was learning it. I'm like, what are we doing? So we built this house, and it's on a server. It's saved. Got hours invested into this game that I don't like, but I love that boy right there. And that's my boy. You want to know what I value? I value my relationship with God, my wife, and my children. If anybody devalues my children, I don't like it. You know why? Because that's what God's given me. That's my purpose sitting right over there. So what do I do? Noah decides and like our whole world's gone. He changes our world. You've changed our world before. You know it. He's like, I never. My hypocrisy meter's going up. No, just kidding. Cultivate the relationship. You're anointed to do that. Your wife is not anointed to cultivate your children. She's anointed to make the atmosphere in the home great. She's anointed to, to, to be an amazing mother and train them in the things of God. But the father is to cultivate and show the importance. And sometimes when you're farming, the land fights back. Men, sometimes your kids are going to fight you on it. But look at the end goal. That hopefully your kids will know that you value God, you value their mother, and that you grow, and now they value God. Because you did your part. I want you to wait for part two next year. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> two things I want you to walk away with this. If you're going to be a father, be all in. Be all in. Don't be too busy to be a dad. Your purpose now is to be a dad. Don't sit there and take glory. Listen, if you, we have three kids. I never thought I was going to have three kids, but I do. I wouldn't change it for the world. But I have to put value on my purpose. My purpose is not my job or my career. My purpose is to show these young people priorities, God first. Second thing, embrace the role of a father. Embrace it. Love it. When you're driving home on your way from work, you know, I say, I only live five minutes away. Take ten minutes to get home then. But when you come in, embrace the role as a father. Psych yourself up. Pray for that energy. Lord, Holy Spirit, please quicken my mortal body. Make me alive. Let me tell you something. When I get in the house, my kids are like, why? Woo! We're ready to party. And they should because they're kids. 
and I should be a godly father and come in, yeah, me too, let's do it, you know? That's, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's how we do it. I love you guys. I'm going to close with this. It's never too late to start doing it the right way. Never too late to start doing it the right way. You might say, well, my kids are already grown. My kids are already set in their ways. Listen, have you changed from where you were last year to where you are right now? If you did it, they can do it because they're from you. We love you guys at Faith Family Church. We value the family. At Faith Family Church, there's a reason why Pastor Mike and Donna, the name was so strong in their heart, Faith Family Church. Faith should be the most important thing in your life because your faith dictates who you are. Family should be the second most important thing in your life. After your family is taken care of, then you do your calling. Your first calling is to your family. Okay? You guys getting this? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. You know, I say, why are you bowing your head and close your eyes? Because this is the part of church that's my favorite part. It's the opportunity that people that don't know God, don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, have an opportunity to call Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. And what we do at this time, we don't tell people to come down. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to give you an opportunity that on June 18th, you had the opportunity to have a decision for Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Is there anybody in here right now that you'd like to make that decision? I see your hand. That's great. Is there anybody else? I'm not going to call you down. I'm not going to embarrass you. All right. The Bible says this. The Bible says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. Knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord means that you know that Jesus came, lived a perfect life by God's standard, died the death that me and you deserved, and rose again and gave us his free righteousness. That's what believing in Jesus Christ is. So I want us all to say this. Repeat after me. Father, I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.